Howdy meeps and welcome to the Meeple Syrup Show. Hey! <laughs> it's like we planned that or something. Yeah. Welcome Wednesday night, Meeps. It's San Jesse, Erica, and with us tonight we have Deidre Goldrick Foss from Funko, and we're here tonight on the Meeple Syrup Show to I don't know to have fun and talk about all things tonight. So, um, what's going on, Jess? What's going on? Uh, so, I'll use my quick intro time to make an announcement. So, last week we had thrown up a survey on the Patreon to figure out what kind of extra work I was going to be doing for the Maple Syrup team. And if I recall correctly, uh, doing a Maple Syrup boot camp program uh, won out just barely by one vote. Mm -hmm. And so I'll start that on Friday. So tune into the Shop Talk page. And if you need a little bit of accountability and a little bit of support, getting one of your projects all the way to a stage where you can comfortably pitch it at a con, um, see what's up on Friday and shop talk. And, uh, and that's going to be our goal for the next six months together. Uh, and I'm going to run that. So. Good. And so that's Yay! what the camp's all about. It's about getting your, your button gear collectively, right? Jess? Yeah, that's right. So, okay. Excellent. So how are you going to disseminate that info on shop talk? Yeah, um, so we'll we'll run the boot camp primarily through Shop Talk. There will be a post with and a video on Friday where I'll talk more about the details. But I've already started planning it out. It's going to be great. It'll run from November first until March thirtieth. Wow! First, I don't know what the last day of March is, uh, which should put us just in time for con season. And the goal will be to have your game, whatever project you decide to run through the boot camp, by March thirty, end of March, April first. It's going to be in a position, and you're going to be in a position to start showing that to publishers at conventions this summer. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And Erica, what's up with you so far this week? Uh, oh, actually, I saw a production copy of Kadama 3D, so I was very excited because it looks beautiful, and so I'm very happy Yay. for that coming out soon. And I wrote progress reports, so yay, school stuff? <laughs> I don't That's know. good. <laughs> pa parents like those? Parents I'm not sure, like those. I'm not sure I students like them. them or you like them, but at I least don't one think kids care. One, one piece of the equation enjoys those things. So right. So at least those are almost out of my hair, and I can focus on other things. Right, right, right. That's my exciting week. Good. But let's introduce. Oh, actually, send quickly to you, and then let's introduce. Oh no, I was going to say that's the most exciting thing for me this week is Deidre's here. So let's introduce okay. Deidre. Oh, so, hi. I, yeah, tell us about yourself. Tell us what's going on. Um, well, I don't know. You want to hear about my week or you want to hear yeah. about everything I do? <laughs> what's your Halloween. highlight of the week? Halloween <laughs> my... week. So there's going to be some cool stuff. Whoa. Yeah. Well, I, once we're done here, I got to go back and work on my costume every year here. Well, at Funko Games, formerly, um, Forest Prusan Creative. We always dress up as a game, one of our games for Halloween. Oh, that's awesome. So nice. I'm, I've got a I got a whole thing going on and there's I know there's some people coming as some pretty amazing uh game costumes so we kind of have a competition around that so that's pretty exciting mm -hmm. but and so everybody has to surprise a different game yes. or oh. well you don't know like people do a little bit on the DL to be like by the way are you coming as narwhal free for all because I was also coming as narwhal free for all but who wouldn't uh, want to I mean come on <laughs> narwhals but, Narwhal. What's the average number of narwhals you end up with at your Halloween parties? It's eight. Eight is the average. Eight, eight is the average. That's it's always number. eight. <laughs> no, <laughs> never. Not I mean, yet. If you get nine narwhals, that'd be like one too many, right? Yeah. Then you get all seven this. is seven is just not enough. <laughs> then they're just all fencing with their swords and everything. I see, I see. There'd be no room for anyone else. All right. Yeah, very nice. Very nice. Very nice. So yeah, today we're mm. here to talk about like Funko and the industry and wow. the, the, we had <clears throat> some of <coughs> excuse me your designers on here a little while ago uh, we've had a, a bunch of a bunch of people from FP slash Funko on in the in recent memory mm -hmm. so it's been it's been a good run and we'd like to know from your aspect from your point of view uh, mm -hmm. what is happening inside the industry from DCC's point of view because we know what Chris thinks Right. I've right. heard what Nathan thinks. <laughs> you, we, you, want, we want your thoughts on the matter. Yeah. Well, um, so I'm I've been at in the game business for almost 13 years. And um 
And in that time, I've, I've actually spent my whole career in the game business here um, at Forest Prusan Creative, and then now since February as part of uh, Funko, now that we are uh, Funko Games. So it's a really, it's a really exciting time for us. And it's a really, it's a really interesting transition to go from being an independent inventor to now take our whole team and we're all now inside of a publisher. And, and that's been a really interesting process. It's kind of changed our changed our day-to-day -day, uh, life in, in some ways, but in other ways, it hasn't changed uh, because we were we were already so integral to the product that we were um, putting out with our publishing partners. So um, yeah, thanks for having me mm -hmm. on. It's I, I was always jealous of uh, Chris and Nathan because <laughs> they got to be be here and talk with you guys. Because I'm well, you should be really 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 jealous of Steph Straw because she used to host it sometimes with us. So I know That's Steph true. is very cool, and I see her in the chat. She's on here. <laughs> commenting yes but, and uh, she has a uh, she has asked jason to ask santa questions and when's <laughs> stephanie straw gonna get a raise oh well that would be something that i need to ask dcc dcc when is stephanie straw going to get a raise i i cannot discuss that on podcast <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that's great that's great i hope there's other folks great. from my team who come in and i look so businessy oh my gosh i can't believe i'm wearing like a suit coat i look yeah you look like you're wearing like an 80s power suit almost i, I mean no offense but oh that's I, perfect for oh, what yeah, you guys like are the, doing you should be wearing an 80s power suit the shoulder the shoulder pads your mighty nostalgia yeah ways. that's it's awesome. true i was yeah. uh the other day i came in in this really crazy sweater and actually stephanie commented that i that i looked like a a villain from an 80s ski movie so i can oh <laughs> you, like, someone like, posted my bad did you it might have been me. Oh, like better okay. off dead or something like that. Yeah, Aspen Extreme. Nice. Yeah, I was gonna say like ski school or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, ski school. Oh my gosh! Wow. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna have to go watch. I'm gonna have to go see if those are on Netflix. I I have my nostalgia. No, they. There. I'm sure they Bubbling don't up. hold up. They can't hold up. Come yeah. on, we've got wardrobe. They, they, wardrobe they did gold. not hold up in the '80s, so I'm just. I just want to watch them because. No, I know. you know, you know, uh, don't tempt us. We'll make a game out of anything up in here. Right? So, yeah, so, that's, that's uh, totally true. They will. I, so, I made a wish list if we get time I, that I must oh, share. <laughs> you guys give that to me. Yeah. Yes. Don't let her at it. She will do it. She I will, will make. It. I will make whatever crazy idea you have. They're, they're my my future predictions on what should happen. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, we'll take bets. We'll take bets. So um, before we start to the questions, I'm just going to go up and down well, here the, before, the chat. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. I was going to say, before we get like uh, transition too much from uh, from this into the, the detailed conversation, Deirdre, can you just let our viewers know what your role in Funko is just so that sure. we can orient? Yeah, because I got it totally wrong. So... <laughs> No worries. So I, um, I'm the director of product development here at Funko Games. And um, before that, I was the VP of product development at Forest Prusan Creative. Okay, that's a lot of big words. Can you boil that down? Like, what do you actually do? Oh, make it easy for Sen to understand. Oh, my goodness. So I, um, I generally oversee all the things that narrow it down. Um, totally. whatever. <laughs> I don't oversee um, marketing and stuff like that, but um, from game concept all the way through uh, final production files and um, overseeing even, um, you know, the sourcing team uh, for games and stuff like that. So um, pretty much if there's stuff coming out of uh, FPC, Prospero Hall, Funko Games, I am working on it, and uh, mm -hmm. it's my it's my team uh, that's helping get it out the door. Right, right, right. I heard that you were you actually, you know, had this great hand in learning how to like source stuff for the manufacturer and all that kind of thing. When originally that wasn't the idea behind FPC, and sure. you started having to do that, so you you gained some skills along the way, I guess, right? Yeah, well, you know, it's like there's, I think that's an opportunity many of us have uh, throughout our careers is to, um, you know, kind of come in as one thing and then grow into something else. 
Uh, and when I started at FPC back in 2007, I, um, I was one of just two uh, employees in the company. I was the number two employee. And um, then the other employee uh, became a full partner. So I was the only employee for five years almost. And um, so I wore a lot of hats. And actually, that was one of the things that attracted me to FPC originally was that opportunity to be a big part of a small company. And that's something uh, that I really like to do because um, I know I have the capacity and a lot of us do to grow and learn uh, in whatever we're doing. And uh, I saw FPC as a, a, a place to do that. And um, the partners here at FPC, Andy and Alan and Jay were really um, encouraging and uh, welcoming to, to me and whatever, new thing I wanted to try. So as uh, we got bigger and we got a greater workload, um, you know, it's like, hey, do you want to do you want to be a producer in charge of these things? And I say, yeah. And do you want to do this other thing? Yeah. Oh, I'll take it. I'll take a crack at that. And I think a lot of us have those opportunities um, in our, you know, as uh, inventors and product developers, you know, at some point you guys said, yeah, I'm going to try that and let's see what happens. And then, you know, next thing you know, you've got games on the shelf at Barnes and Noble or Target or wherever, because you just said, yeah, sure. I can take a crack at that. Um, uh, uh, Chris says that I, I have this, well, I have a saying, which is uh, fake it till you make it. But he says that what I actually do is I make it until I make it. So um, I just <laughs> figure it out. So uh, I guess, overseeing production and things like that. Um, that was part of that. It came to a point where one of our, um, one of our publishing partners needed um, more bandwidth and then I, sure, I can do that. Uh, and so that's how we got, we just kind of grow in all directions just based on that. So, so on the, on the topic of growth and change, uh, shifting back to where things are now, What's the biggest thing that's changed inside FPC Funko since the change in location in the industry, since you've become Funko that you can tell yeah. us about? It's the biggest positive thing that's changed. Um, well, really, it's it's all been so very positive. Uh, we are we're really excited to be part of Funko, and it's it's been amazing. I mean, they're they're world class. In I mean. Look at you know their marketing and their you know their manufacturing and they're just they're an incredible incredible organization. So we're really glad to be a part of that. I think um, for us one of the interesting things you know we were perhaps I, I don't know maybe someone out there knows of a bigger invention and product development studio uh, in the North America. Uh, I don't think there is anybody bigger than us inventing games, um, and it it's interesting because it. It's a lot of hustle, uh, you guys know. Uh, it's a lot of hustle pitching your games and schlepping around and doing all the stuff. And you know, we're still pitching, but we're not pitching like a dozen uh, or two dozen publishers to try to place our product and all the work that goes along with that. Um, you know, you pitching and following up and all of that. And so it's been um, it's it's nice because we can be super focused as a group on. It's, you know, we don't have to come up with, you know, 150 concepts to pitch to those 24 people. We can come up, you know, with 45 concepts to pitch, you know, or something. So it's it's been nice because we can focus and we can um, we can do more, uh, you know, go further with our team, I think. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that your, your turnaround time then has changed? Like, are you guys kind of having to accelerate at this point? Or is there, are you finding the transition's been very similar? Um, so far, and it been really nine months into this, but it's been really similar for us. It's, you know, the, because so much of our work was for mass market already, you know, we're kind of on that cadence. And of course, we're still finishing up client work that we have. Um, so we're, we are still doing those things, but I think the biggest change so far has been in the pitch cycle. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, that makes total sense. There's, it's, it's totally changed for you guys, right? So it's yeah. good. Uh, yeah. Before we go on, I just want to go through the list and make sure we're saying hi to everybody. Hello to <laughs> Zach Connolly, Jim Baker, Steph Straw, Daryl Andrews, Jason Miller, Jason Mohan. Who else is in here? Jamie Jones, more Jason Miller, more Daryl Andrews, more Stephanie Straw, Bad Bachelor. Yes, there's tons of people in the in the whole thing. There's more people. 
Where'd they go? I yeah, it, we're we're having some glitches in the in the chat, but I'll say there's been a lot of dear Deirdre love in the chat going on for how amazing she is and how much yeah, work she does. Oh, there we go, Matt Christensen, Jessica Davis. So lots of people here just to hear about how awesome you are. Uh, Daryl said something that was really nice. He said, "You are a rock star in the board game industry," and so I think there's a lot of a lot of good. To come out of uh, FBC, that yeah. it's kind of unheralded, under un, un, unheralded, um, yeah. and yeah. unknown. And yeah. so, hopefully, we'll we'll break a little bit of that today and and tell a little bit of those stories. Um, and then, you know, a lot of people are saying questions like this: Steph Straw planting a question, uh, saying, "How go. much of FBC and, and Prospero Hall is still in Funko Games?" What percentage of people and idea and control has been maintained since being purchased by Funko? And what advantages have you gained by being acquired by Funko? What do you think? Lots well, of good uh, questions. So many good questions. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, well, not a plant. Not, <laughs> yeah, not a plant. Not a plant. Does not directly Does go, report okay. to me. Um, uh, so what's great about the acquisition is that um, Funko didn't have a, they didn't have a game division existing. So this isn't like a big game publisher acquiring a little studio and absorbing all of their, their capability or there's no redundancy, right? So what we do is so different than the collectibles business. It's just a totally different industry. And so 100% um, of our creative team is still here at, 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 at Funko Games. Um, Andy, Andy Allen and, uh, Andy and Allen, uh, Forrest and Prusan, they retired, um, in August. Uh, so they, they've moved on to do other things and it was a good opportunity for them to do that. They've been, you know, doing this for 25 years. So, um, but I, you know, I'm still here and, um, Jay Wheatley, who, uh, is, um, uh, he was one of the partners with Andy and Alan. He's still here and he's our general manager. So he's running the business unit, which is, which is terrific because um, with our, with our experience and, um, and our, our team and the, the team that we've built, it's really, it's really great. They, they're very dedicated to keeping us all together. And in fact, we're still here in our Seattle office, not uh, relocated to Everett. So that's really nice. Mm -hmm. So um, they're really they're really supportive of what we're doing, and they're really you know when we tell them like we think this is a killer idea, here's something we really believe in. They're like, wow, okay, that sounds really cool. And so they're just really they're really supportive, and we're excited to be part of Funko. And then as far as uh, the follow up question, what are the advantages to being part of Funko? I would say um, it's it's really. I mean, they have an incredible, they have so many incredible teams up there. And among them, like their licensing team, um, Funko has uh, more than 1,100 licenses already. Um, and so it's it's incredible for us to, you know, be a part of an organization like that, where they already have all these great connections. And there's so much opportunity for interesting things we could do. I mean, you guys know, we, we do crazy things sometimes, you know, we made made the Bob Ross game before Bob Ross was quite as huge as he is now. Um, we, you know, did uh, Choose Your Own Adventure. We did you, Kenny G, you know. <laughs> you made a board game about a notebook. We made yeah. a Trapper Keeper game. Actually, uh, <laughs> Stephanie was the producer on that project and uh, very important to the, the gameplay development. So it's, uh, we will make a game about a lot of things, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So that that actually great. connects to a question a question that I had. So is it now like you get to be like a kid in the candy store when it comes to these brands and these IPs? Are you still seeking them out or are you are they kind of saying we'd like you to look at these things? Yeah, sure. We are still seeking things because there's things like Trapper Keeper, for example, which um Funko wouldn't have already had a license for something like that because it's not you can't make a pop figure out of it. You can't make cereal out of it. Well, maybe, maybe you can. Maybe you uh, um, but there's a, you know, like there's kind of, they did kind of certain types of brands. And so we had a, uh, like there's some overlap, but then otherwise they're, we're still bringing them things that are kooky and weird. So. <laughs> you say that like, it's a bad thing. It's a great no, thing. It's good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just saying hello to, well, hello to, 
Alana in the background over there in Jesse's picture. But also, hello <laughs> to Cassandra off, Whitaver, Travis Magrum, and I hear Bruce Vogue is also in the house. So Bruce uh, from North Star, host of the Party Game Cast, awesome guy. So good to have people there. Now, Daryl Andrews, uh, <laughs> one of our alumnus, I guess you could call him, one of the founders of Meeple Syrup with me, asked a question. He said, question, what was an unexpected difference from being an inventor studio to becoming a publisher. Mm. Wow. I guess, it, I, that, hi, Daryl. That's nice to see you. Um, huge fan. Um, we, uh, it's hard to even uh, kind of wrap up what's, what's, what the differences are other than this sort of so far, like the, for us, the pitching and, and that kind of change, it's been really interesting to be more involved with the, um, you know, with what the marketing team is doing, those kind of things like product launch, like our, our incredible presence at Gen Con last summer with the Funkoverse launch. That was like, they just blew us away. We couldn't believe how spectacular that was. So um, I think there are some changes like that. And, you know, just getting used to being part of a, a huge company. Our studio, we were 25 people. Now we're part of a 700 person company. You know, it's like, oh, we have an HR department. It's like, oh, I can't say those things. They're inappropriate. Like, <laughs> you know, things like that just have to be, uh, you know, like, I, and I'm not I'm not used to being part of a big company. I've always worked for small businesses. So that's a, that's an interesting change. Yeah. Mm, very interesting. Awesome. Daryl has some follow up questions. So I'm going to just ask them because they're okay. here. Uh, Daryl asks, how did you recruit and develop your team and the culture around it? And, I'll, and a little sub question there. Uh, what's the unique thing about the people at Funko? What did you look for to hire into your team? Oh, that's. That's a really good question. So we, you know, a lot of our team, and I kind of talked about this at the top of the show, um, for many, many years, I was one of the only employees. And because, especially the mass game business is so cyclical, um, they're really, you know, just a couple of big product sets every year. Our product work goes up and down with that seasonally. So we've always been a big contractor house. Like we've always had lots of contractors and they might come back We've got contractors who work for us now who've been working for us for 12 or more years. They just come back every year. You know, we get busy in the fall. They're going to come in and help us out. So that is um, that's that's part of our recruitment is oftentimes we bring people in as contractors and see, you know, what we do. It might be kind of weird or it 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 might be kind of different for people. And and we're highly collaborative. And that doesn't necessarily work out for, for everybody. You know, it's like, we're not looking for someone who's like a star, you know, like we want someone who's like, let's, you know, nobody knows my name usually because I'm toiling in the background because I want to be part of a team. And like, so you kind of have to have a certain type of personality. And so as we're recruiting or developing our team and our culture, that's part of it. Like who, you know, who clicks, who like really grocks what we're doing and wants to be a part of that. And like, how does that kind of flow over time? So, um, you know, it might be that someone contracts for us, you know, for a season or two seasons, and then it might, you know, come back the next year. And then turns out like our business is a little bigger and we have an opportunity to hire someone and then they can, they can stick around. And it was, you know, in the 18 years that FPC was around, it was a very slow, very slow growth um, and very purposeful in who joined our team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now you seem to be just snapping up people. <laughs> We're busy. We're busy. Yeah. Um, like every that, second I look, one of my friends is moving to Seattle. It's awesome. Yeah. It's, we've been very yeah. fortunate. And actually that kind of goes to that, uh, that thing about, what I said also about Funko and not yet having a games team in house, like they're not, they didn't acquire us because they want us to stop doing the magical thing that we do. Mm -hmm. They want us to grow that and keep doing it and do it, you know, do it more. Um, and so, and that's what we're working on. So that's why there's a few more people moving to Seattle. So, yeah. so this is a good time to ask another audience question that just came up. Sure. Um, following up on that. So Adam Young is wondering if you can say, is there something you want to be able to do with your teams one day that maybe isn't part of the current mode of operation? 
I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, Adam, I don't know how to answer your question exactly. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff we're doing um, and different models that, that we're, that we're always exploring, you know, um, if you're talking about like team structure and like as business, how we do things, um, uh, you know, I know there are some creative uh, agencies who do like they have um, their products might move through different groups and kind of get handed off. Um, uh, one thing that's strength about our team is that um, our producers are, we see them as carriers of the flame. They're creatives. They're heavily invested in their projects. They're adding to the, the game development, the creative, uh, the art, all of those things. And so um, they are, you know, they're flame carriers. So we don't, we, we don't have a process where we hand product off. Um, like, oh, now, you know, game design is done. Now art should take over. Like we, we do it as an integrated mode. Mm -hmm. That's really, really neat. We have some more questions. We have a question here from Jason Miller. He says, I read on Facebook <laughs> that you purchased FFG and Simon. True or not true? True or more true? I didn't read this before I Press the button, Jason. Thanks a lot. I was, I was just gonna say, he said. So, and you should know by now that Jason Miller's questions are not are often not legitimate. Yeah, but let's offering? let's answer this now. Is this true or more true? True or more true? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I have not. Uh, I, I'm gonna need to have a C option on this. I have not heard that Fantasy Flight is for sale. But <laughs> but if it was, but if it was. <laughs> We're coming for you. That's right. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, I have a question. I can a legitimate so I can one or a Jason Miller I do. question? I don't know. No, 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 is I'll it about mind. how Captain Crunch is going to end up in Twilight Imperium 5th edition? <laughs> only if we acquire FFG. <laughs> oh, we got to make this happen. We're talking about dream oh, games here. So yeah, you heard it here first, people. <laughs> Captain so Crunch many space is going to end up. Come. Oh, okay. Okay. Come on. I'd like to see that too. That's funny. But, okay. Real question. Real, real talk. Just, just real talk. Real talk. Real talk. Sorry. Um, just uh, because we've actually now straddled these two different ideas of both types of games, of both hobby and uh, of mass. You guys walk this really weird line between the two. How do you maintain that? And are you being forced to maybe focus more on mass, more hobby? Is it a definitive line? Like what's going on kind of along that line? No, I think, um, you know, uh, m many years ago, our, our team identified that um, as uh, that the mass aisle was shifting more towards, you know, st strategy and things like that. And um, uh, where we had been making a lot of games for kid and family. Um, but what, of course, we're gamers and we, we really liked to play um, strategy games and heavier family games. So it was a great opportunity for us to move in that direction. Um, as far as, you know, what we're being forced to do, um, nobody's, you know, we're making we're making what people want to buy. And mm. um, while people want to buy games at Target and Walmart, like Villainous and Horrified and um, things that, you know, that we love to play, like, like that, I think uh, we'll absolutely continue making them. But we're we we love uh, making games for kids too. I think there's an incredible incredible opportunity for us to turn the next generation into gamers, and especially as we talk about like how do we make gaming more inclusive? How do we get you know more women on the invention side? How do we get you know, more people of color into this, you know, as a hobby, as a, as a vocation, all of these things, we have to look at the next generation. And, mm -hmm. and part of that is making games for those kids and making games for, for those families, making games that bring people into it early and as a hobby. So um, is uh, part of that kind of where Funkoverse then comes from, because you very much have that toyetic strategy game. Is yeah. that sort of that flow of that idea then? That's you know one of many, uh, and also our our roots as as a company FPC. You know we we cut our teeth making games for Cranium. I see you've got a copy of the old Cranium game on your shelf back there, Erica. Um, oh, yeah, I was gonna say um, I also think horrified yeah, is right there too. I thought you were horrified. I was glad. Um, Very appropriate this time of year. I I'm obsessed with people's shelfies. I have to always look. Um, but we. 
uh, you know, we first did, um, we were doing preschool games for Cranium. Um, among them, this game called Caribou, which sold uh, over a million units. And we have people who are adults now bringing their kids into play test with us who say, when I was a child, I played that game. I love that game. It, you know, it changed, it, it, made, it meant something special to me. So we're, you know, like, are we, are we being forced to make strategy? Are we being forced to do something else? We want to make things that bring people into gaming and, mm -hmm. you know, however that, however that manifests. So can, so for, for designers that are interested in making that part of their own mission statement, do you have any tips or bits of advice that you could, could provide for how one could approach designs in a way that helps achieve that goal of bringing people into the community? I think, yeah, that's a really interesting question. And we, we talk about that a lot. Um, it, it, I think part of it is making, like being empathetic, you know, and thinking about who your consumer is. Like if you're trying to bring children into this hobby, thinking about, and you know, when you're developing your game, think about who, who this person is. Like, is mom playing this with them? Like how busy is she? Like, what else is she up to? Like, does she, like, how long does this game take to learn? How long, like, is it, is it, a, she look at it and she's like, oh, that's going to be a hassle for me to, to play. Or is it, you know, like I follow mom blogs. I see this one this weekend. They're like, oh, that feeling when you want to have a nice Saturday, but your kid wants to play a game. And I'm like, oh, that breaks my heart. Right? Like. <laughs> that should be a nice Saturday for you too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's some other things going on. Right. And so I think like for, for us, like as we think about bringing people in, like why are people, are we bringing new people in with something like Horrified? Yeah, we probably are because the Universal Monsters are like the mascots for Halloween, right? Like people are like, yeah. I got my neighbors to play it and they don't play that type of game and they loved it. So, and they loved like, it. Mm. Right. so you know, that's part of it too. Like bringing people in through interesting licensing ideas or like lowering the bar on the game mechanic, like all those kind of things are gonna open up the industry for new people. That's something I thought that that FPC and now Funko have always done really well is understood the differences between what you can aim at mass and what you can aim at a hobby. <coughs> and um, just, you know, off the top of your head, uh, DCC, what is what are the top three things, the top three things that you could recommend to game designers in terms of if you want to hit mass, do blah. Hmm. I don't know. Sen, you might be asking for the secret sauce. I know. It's a little <laughs> bit of secret sauce. But, so you can give us a semi-secret sauce. You can go down your to like number 15 and 16 and 17, and everybody else will think it's like one, two, and three. Okay. You know better. Uh, I can give you the oh, it's got ketchup, it's got mayonnaise, it's got yeah, 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 yeah. Island dressing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Um, all, all the <laughs> obvious ones. Well, I think really um, the most the most obvious is um, that that you understand your audience, and and that goes for toys too. Um, I'm the uh, co chair of the Seattle chapter of Women in Toys, and uh, we talk about this with members of our group. You know, if they're working on a new thing, they're going to pitch. Um, we say, you know, what what are you know who is your audience? Who is this for? And you know, that's number one. And the number two is what is the white space. What makes this product? What? Why? Why does it need to exist? Like that. That's a question right there. You know, why do you? You're making. I don't know. Whatever it is, you're gonna make a new action figure. Well, right. what does it do that's so special? Why does? Why does someone need to buy it? So, um, audience, you're recapping at the bottom of the screen. Thank yeah. you, audience. <laughs> and then, and then, what's the opportunity? What's the reason there is space for this thing? And then, I think. You know, it's just also, it's always good to have um, some sort of uh, hook, like what makes it interesting, you know, if that's like, well, the, the hook is it's 30 dice, you know, and that's, people love dice and that's really special. Or, you know, it comes packed in a little tiny trapper keeper. That's what makes it special. So, you know, you kind of, those would be kind of three, three things I wouldn't want to walk out of the door if I don't know the answer to. Good. That's fair. That's awesome. uh, Daryl actually has a question. 
Uh, he says, what things have you learned from play testing? So for example, what kind of questions do you ask? And then how do you record, measure, analyze that type of data? Do you have a system that you're able to share some of it with us? Yeah, um, we are, we're very into play testing and you guys know this uh, about us as a studio. And actually back, you know, in the old days when we got started, we were unusual. Uh, for that, for the amount of playtesting we would do, though it's more common now. We, um, some of the kind of things we learn, um, mostly when we're playtesting, we're looking for, <laughs> it's not enough dice, um, we're looking for what's not working. I actually, in playtesting, you know, if, if it's working, that's good. I'm glad you're liking it, but you might be liking it because you like me and you're my friend or you're my cousin and I'm paying, I'm giving you pizza. Like you're going to be nice about it and tell me you like my game. What I want to know is what's not working. Like, uh, you know, if you, okay, what, were there too many little fiddly bits? Were you having a hard time picking up these little pieces? Was, you know, was this hard to comprehend? Like, did you not understand what, what the object of the game was until I came in and told you, or was it obvious from the rules? You know, like there's there's a lot of things like that. So that's the number one thing we're looking for, what's not working. And then follow on, how do we record, measure, analyze the data? Well, we have a bunch of passive uh, wall-mounted cameras all around our uh, playtesting room, which we can reconfigure so we can see what's going on if we want to zoom in on the tabletop oh, or something fun. like that it's very fun and um and then it's actually dreamy. we have a closed there's a closed circuit here in our office so we can watch the play testing room from our desks too so even um like the graphic designers might especially for a long game like like horrified can take an hour to play the graphic designer could turn on you know the play test and have that going on like a podcast in the background hearing what's working somebody's like I can't tell what this graphic is supposed to be or something, mm. something they can quickly like go and take a look, you know, make sure they got their ear out for what's happening and what's not working. And um, so we're recording it with all of our electronic devices, but um, really it comes down to the experience of the producer on the project and them uh, either sitting in the room with the play testers or sitting in the observation room, looking in through the one way glass um, and watching, watching how people react. And that's, um, cause we're, we're very, we're very into observational, uh, testing because we find that that tells us a lot more even than a, like a follow-up survey or something, which we also do, right. but, um, it's a little more real how they react. More then, honest. Yeah. When they respond after the fact and think about things that may or may not have happened. Right. Are they leaning forward? Are they really into it? Or are they like way back and they're like, uh, like when is this over? So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, very good, very good. Uh, Daryl is just the font of questions today. He also asked, um, how can the industry become more inclusive? In what ways can we support diversity and help uplift voices? Yeah, wow. That's a really great question. I can see why Daryl was a co-host of the show. Um, <laughs> uh, we, I mean, how, I think, I think we're all doing a lot and there are, you know, conventions and stuff dedicated to this where people are going and trying to improve diversity. Um, it's, it's really difficult because I think that there are, are socioeconomic and uh, other issues tied to why our industry is the way it is. And uh, people with, you know, PhDs and stuff can figure all that out. But um, maybe send you have a PhD. I think you're not in that. Not, Just you know, <laughs> okay, you do. <laughs> you guys figure it out and and let us know. Um, <laughs> but it's um, you know I think uh, making an effort uh, to recruit um, to recruit people to recruit other people to to give up space to those people to talk. Um, you know when we're in. Uh, in meetings and things like that, I think, you know, encouraging women to sit at the table, to have a voice at the table, and this goes for all, you know, business situations. Um, I'm actually very impressed with Funko as a company. Our our CFO 
is a woman. Our CMO is a woman. There are so many women at the highest executive levels of this company. And it's really, it's really awesome. And I'm glad to see that. And so I think, um, you know, giving, giving space for other people and um, creating opportunities. Um, in, in our studio, we, we have a workshopping program, which is beyond our playtesting program. It's like people who we pay to come in and sit and grind away on our games. Like, you know, for example, Villainous, like we had a bunch of magic players on our workshopping team because we wanted them to, because card play, we wanted them to sit and grind away on it. So um, we're actually, to try to be more inclusive of people that have like regular work days and things like that, we've tr been trying to move our workshopping schedule later into the evening so we can get more, um, we can broaden uh, the range of experience of the people. Um, so that's, that's something we've been working on just here in the studio. That's really awesome. <clears throat> Sorry, that's really awesome. Um, it's good to hear. Yeah. So kind of curious then, since we've heard a lot about what's going on, we'd love to hear more about what the future of certain things are, maybe such as Funkoverse or Villainous or okay. other such fun things. Captain oh. Crunch. Captain Crunch. <laughs> Captain Crunch. <laughs> a monster, uh, a monster Crunch expansion. Um, well, uh, I don't have any, I don't have any like big reveals for you guys. I wish oh. I, I wish I did. That's okay. Anything I know is under, under embargo, I guess, but, um, we are very excited about the launch of Funkoverse. Mm -hmm. um, as a game, as a game system, it's, it's an incredible sandbox and it, you know, even Brian Mariotti, our CEO, he has, you know, told people there's more to come. So um, there, there is more, there's more Funkoverse uh, coming. I can tell you that. Well, I know you guys have all already done the the teasers for the Back to the Future. So I'm sure we can only guess kind of what could follow within a very similar umbrella of nostalgia. <laughs> yeah, there's, that would there's nice. so, there's so much opportunity uh, with Funkoverse and all the different directions the gameplay could go. And um, it's very exciting, actually. The 2020 lineup is gonna be very cool. Yeah. We keep hearing that every time we bring another person from Funko on the show. And you leave I wanna, us nothing. I wanna but... post, I, I, I need to post my list secretly somewhere so it can be checked later for verification. Sure, on <laughs> that's like what I need. Like on BGG there's mentally. a thread, yeah. Oh, is there? Is there? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Go hit it Let's up. Tell us what happens. you want. Yeah. Tell us what you want. What you oh, really, really want? If I, if I guess right. Spice Girls. <laughs> so Spice Girls. Go. No, I don't want Spice Girls. I will. Though it depends who you're attacking them against. So people could really enjoy that. Yeah. There you go. I'm, build, I'm building a lot of. I'm building a small fan base tonight for serial based expansions to games. Uh, yes. Bruce Vogue's on is on my side again. Um, um, Adam Adam Young has another another question. Um, how do you on on the topic of Funkoverse? It's it's appropriate. How do you how do you walk the line between um, making an IP product that it's its own experience, but also satisfies the fans of that intellectual property? Yeah, that's well. I think um, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that we're huge pop culture fans. Um, that's why you know joining up with Funko is like yay because. They get it, you know, they get it on such a, like a soul level. So, um, you know, in something like Funkoverse, uh, you know, it is one game, it is one game system. So the under the underpinning, it's not, I mean, the game isn't going to unfold like your favorite Batman movie. It's going to be a, a whole new story, but um, the individual characters is where we balance that uh, fan service. Like when you play as Batman, you're going to, you know, you will feel like him. You're going to do the things he does, even if you're playing uh, up against Blanche, who is like, you know, she's like calling over the guys, but then she's just going to like pound them. So it's like you get to feel, you get to embody the character in something like that with those, one of those. But then something like we're working on something like Villainous, that, that thing is like, like a love letter to you know, to these Disney franchises because we love them, you know? And so with something like that, we get to just, we get to dig in really, really deep into the story and talk about how, you know, what would really, what's the story, what's your new story if you are the hero of the, the villain, you know, of these villainous stories. It, um, everyone's a villain to somebody probably, 
you know, even if it's just your kids because you're telling them they got to go to bed. But <laughs> I hope it doesn't take it to that level. <laughs> no, my kids love the villains. They'd be like, they're like, you're such a Maleficent. It's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Don't make me turn into dragon. <laughs> go to bed. <laughs> cool, cool. And um, what do you think? What do you think? Is there room in the industry for another, like a new FPC now that FPC is no longer FPC? If you get my me my meaning? Yeah. Um, you know, there might be, um, and there might, you know, there might be a reason there's, there's no big companies who did what we do. Uh, you know, it was a lot of, um, we had a lot of uh, lucky breaks over the years um, and some very big clients and um, some amazing opportunities that don't, that are difficult to come by. And um, I would say our, um, you know, the, the partners were especially good uh, business people. And so it allowed us, you know, if you have some, some brilliant, you know, creative business people, around you who are willing to take on the business side of it and free you up to just do creative, um, then, then maybe you could make a, make a run of it as a studio. But I, it was a lot of, it's a lot of mouths to feed, uh, you know, mm -hmm. have 25 people here. I think it, it, it's only something that could grow slowly over time. Um, and then it starts to be like, well, you know, why would I build a company of this size in the service of all these other publishers? for just a small percentage when I could be my own publisher. And that's why you see Kickstarter launching so many incredible publishing companies and, um, you know, folks coming up and, and growing out of that system because it's a more, all of this business is hard, but that's an almost an easier route is, you know, if you could find the capital to, to have a bigger piece of the pie to yourself. I guess. So maybe no. <laughs> so maybe no. Yeah. Cause I mean, Kickstarter is funding the dream for many people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's true. Incredible. And that is, well, that that's a big factor too, is that Kickstarter's main purpose is really that, that kind of pre-funding. You mm -hmm. need that capital. That's the hardest part of almost any business. Yeah. And like, I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like you guys go acts as the venture capitalist, right? So that's interesting. Oh, dog. Oh, dog. It's usually not mine. Uh yeah. It could That's be coming true. from here. You don't know. We have a lot of dogs around this office. Yeah. So I heard that, that you guys let the dogs come in all the time. And I thought that was wonderful. <laughs> There's a lot of dogs. There's going to be a dog costume contest tomorrow for Halloween. Oh, so. and is that like a, is that like a fundraiser? Somebody mentioned a fundraiser in the chat. Mm, yes, we are. That's not a fundraiser, but this weekend we are playing games for extra life. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Great. Okay. So, yeah. so as a, as a group, Funko is going to be doing that. Yes, that's studio. right. That's right. So we're, um, you could, uh, if you go to extra life, extra dash life.org, you could look up um, Funko games in there and you could sponsor us for the kids. Our goal is $10,000. Um, and over the last two years, we've raised over $36,000 um, wow. for kids. Wow. So yeah, we're excited and it's going to be so much fun. Oh, we have, it's just like, it's insane here. We play, we take over the play testing room and the conference rooms and everything. And we just, we go crazy. We eat lots of junk food, play lots of games. It's the best. And is your, is your play testing room with all the cameras, is it also able to stream then, I guess? It doesn't have a uh, streaming capability, oh, but we, okay. we bring in all the equipment and do it. Yeah. Very cool. That is super neat. So, <clears throat> We're coming up to a point in the show, I mean, and this has been super fast, so thank you so much for engaging with the audience, engaging with us about everything uh, Funko. Uh, but we're coming up to a point in the show where we ask you, as our special guest, to give the one piece of advice to um, people who are watching who want to get into the industry in some way, shape, or form from your perspective. So we'll give you a couple minutes to think of that while we're you know, chatting and... Um, then we're going to drop the hammer. So you got a couple seconds though. Okay. Uh, just before we get there, just wanted to please reiterate to everyone um, to check out everybody else in the role to play podcast network. There's a bunch of really good podcasts. Uh, if you're into role playing games, if you're into being a better GM or game master, the role play, the role to play network has a whack of other shows that might just fit the bill all the way from actual plays 
to discussing, you know, the <clears throat> people on those actual plays to discussing role playing in general. So a lot of good information. So check out the role to play network. Also, please do check out our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash meeple syrup. And if you support us at any level, you will have access to a bunch of cool stuff. I just posted a panel that Erica uh, and I did along with Jay Cormier and Tim Brown about contracts and contract negotiation from Fan Expo this year. And I'll be posting more. I've finally got some of the video off my camera, I think. And we'll see if we can edit that into something that's viewable uh, by the patrons. And so only if you're a patron can you get that access. So we have a lot of good stuff coming up. Jesse's uh, boot camp is through Patreon. So lots of good stuff. Uh, Jesse and Erica, anything that you guys want to say? Well, don't forget, on top of being, if you're part of uh, part of our Patreon, is our community episode is next week, and that gives you access to be on the episodes as well, or ask questions that you need answered. Right. So next week. Next Super week. Important. <laughs> community episode. It's um, next week. Yep. Yeah. And the only thing I want to say is just to remind everybody that if you're interested in boot camping uh, one of your designs, or even starting a new project and having it pitchable by the summer. Um, Check out the Maple Syrup Shop Talk page on Friday. I will be posting more information about how that boot camp is going to go over the next few months. Um, and then also, if you've not heard of the Maple Syrup Shop Talk page, that's our Facebook page that's attached to our group. You just look on the group page. There's a little button that says visit the something. Anyway, click that button and ask to join Shop Talk, and you can uh, go on in there and ask your design questions and be part of the Maple Syrup community. Yeah, it's a great community. People are really good at engaging and answering good, things good, good. of kind of any yeah. nature. Good. So, yes. Deirdre, ready. And we are now <laughs> circling back. And Deirdre, if you could give one piece of advice to aspiring designers or future participants in the industry, what would mm -hmm. you tell them all? Um, well, because my perspective is being, um, you know, inside, inside of a company um, and not you know, independent, but kind of not independent um, as part of this team. I think that um, my number one, my number one thing that has served me the best is I, I say yes to new opportunities. Um, even if they, even if I don't necessarily know how I'm going to do it, I trust that I'm going to get, I'm going to get there. I'm going to figure it out. And, um, and, and I think just saying yes to new opportunities and being willing to help other people. I think that's like so cool. I know you guys are part of that, you know, where you're, you know, mentoring people and bringing new people up. I think, you know, helping other people can be a, it's such a learning experience for both sides and it can make everyone so much stronger. So, you know, I just, when there's a new opportunity, I try to say yes to it and then, you know, see what happens. And so often um, I learn and grow and I end up with more opportunity. So cool. <clears throat> Before you go, we have a couple seconds to do some other questions really quick. A lightning round. <clears throat> Who are you rooting for in the World Series? Go. Houston Astros. Houston Astros. That's um, for comments. Are you ever going to write a write a book? Uh, yes, I am. What's it going to be about? It's going to be called Make It Until You Make It. Thank oh, you. Oh, nice. Very nice. Um, <laughs> with the Funko merger, is there a dream IP that you personally would love to work with that you have not had access to before, but because of the merger you have access to now? Yes. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> She'll tell us because she got it. Okay. Yeah. So if you know enough about Deirdre, you already know the answer to that. There was one more that was at the very top. Would you oh, ever make something. a dry erase pop? A dry erase pop. That's interesting. I'll tell HQ you want to dry erase pop. <laughs> I can see that being a game. <laughs> yeah. I well, okay, so, you have to so like, what? There, there was, was one. Pictionary. That, Pictionary man. That's right. Could, yeah, except if it was on. a pop, it would have been more yeah. popular. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah, I, I do that all the time. Cool. Uh, well, it is, we hit the mark exactly. Look, we're hitting the post yeah. like professional or something. It wow. is 10 o'clock p.m. here, which means it's seven o'clock where Deidre is. So it's that time of the night when we say goodbye to everybody. So on that note, next week, we have the community program coming up. Jesse will have stuff up on Friday about the boot camp. 
uh, go play Funkoverse because it is actually awesome, right? It's the funniest thing. I should have put that behind me. Thank right? you. Put the Thank you. Up. <laughs> it is a great game. So if you like miniatures games and if you like pop culture characters, you you owe it to yourself to give it a try. If you and only hear, like one of those things, you owe yourself. You still to owe yourself. Yeah. And I hear I hear that Horrified is amazing as well. So in the spirit of it. Halloween, Thank you go it. give that a try as well. Thanks, on, guys. Movie monsters. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Yeah. And we'll oh, talk to more that. Funko people yeah. soon, I'm sure. Steph Straw, Cassandra Whitaver, Andrew Wolf, they'll all come on the show at some point. So. Awesome. Well, eventually, just, it'll just become the Funko show. All right. All right. We'll, we'll do it. Okay, cool. <laughs> and everybody else, thank you so much. Come to the... Um, People's Europe Shop Talk page. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Senfung Lim. Jesse, where do we find you? On Twitter at TT Void and also in Maple Syrup Shop Talk. Yes. Erica, where do we find you? Uh, Twitter is Frenemy Games, friend with an I, because it's actually friends. And I'm still working on the Instagram thing. So if you could check that out. <laughs> it's the funniest thing ever. And you can and, find it's yeah. my name at Purse Barrel Hall. Yeah. Don't forget us. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah, Santa yeah, Game Where do we find you? At Prospero Hall. Awesome. Excellent. Yeah. So everybody go check out at Prospero Hall because he is an amazing designer. Or she. Is, or they. 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 It's a they. they. It's a they. <laughs> they a is collective. a collective. It is a collective. Awesome. Okay. So, and Support. until then, uh, oh, let's let's exit on, on this. I like this. Say yes to opportunities and be willing to help other people. I'm gonna we're gonna steal that, Dieter. Is that okay? Please do. The world that, that actually That's does pretty much embody meeple syrup yeah i love you guys you're awesome yeah, we love you too we love you too yay and on that note i think we've got to say goodbye good night Bye. everyone Bye. good night good night thanks so much for listening to the meeple syrup show if you'd like to support us on all of our projects please check out our patreon page at www.patreon.com backslash meeple syrup hope to see you next week